So you are welcome once again. The first thing we are going to do now is to plot the data. Plot this data set into Excel. I'm sure by now you've all plotted it. Let me see by hands all those who have plotted it already into Excel. Let me see by hands all those who have plotted it into Excel. I have five. So doc. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so please, you said we should plot the first period. Yes. So that's what I have done. I mean, oh. you've typed, you've typed, just those who have typed. Okay. Okay. Typed, not the graph. I'm not talking about the graph. I'm talking about what you see on your screen now. If you have typed it into Excel, all of it into Excel, let me know. Regarding the plot, we'll come to the plot. I see only 10, 12 hands out of the 18 people here. I see only 12 hands. This count. Please, I said raise your hand if you have a data set. If you don't raise your hand, you just have to tell me why you are not raising your hand before I come and tell you. Base count. Hello, Doc. Why is your hand not raised? No, I'm typing. It's not picking. I didn't say raising hand doesn't call for typing. It's just clicking. Yeah, I'm clicking. It's not picking. That is why. Daniel. I'm with yes. Deborah. Yes, Doc. He's typing. I'm almost done. You are not doing it. Yes, please, Doug. I didn't have this. You are not going to use my screen to do this. Uh, no, it's like it's not showing up. No, but I'm saying that you all have the slides. Don't you guys have the slides? You don't have the slides. No, please, Doug. You've all typed the data. Can we proceed? Yes, please. Yes, please. Right. So what I want you to do now is look at the data you have and scatter plot. Scatter plot. Now, how you scatter plot it, let me show you briefly. Do you all know how to scatter plot it? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. So scatter plot just the numbers, not the names of the DMUs, not the column of the inputs. Okay. Now I can see that this is two inputs, one output. So you scatter plot the three and five, three and three, five and two, eight and two, seven point five and three. You're going to highlight them from three, stretch it to five, and then drag it all the way down. And then you go to your Excel insert. And then when you go to your insert, you look for the graph and then choose scatter. The dots, you can click on them and maximize them, tweak them, merge them to the other. And make sure that you label them. Now, these labels that you see, 3, 5, 3, 3, 5, 2, you know, A2 and so forth. These labels are automatically generated by the scatter plot in the Excel. But you will have to label the names of the DMUs yourself. So you will use text box. You will use text box, which you can also get from insert. And then the text box, once you click it on where the name the plot is. You cannot type the name as you know it. You will let your data guide you. The reason why I'm going through this slightly with you is because when students are supposed to demonstrate a data set, a data set, they struggle. They struggle. So you need to learn how to generate your artificial data set, 
how to scatter plot it and how to use it in alpha analysis. Okay. And this is a input x1 and x2. So x1 is on the x axis, and then the x2 is on the y axis. You can see here that I have not labeled them. I've not labeled the axis in my own here. Okay. Now, when you now click on the, when you create your text box, you want to understand that you can nudge it either on the right of the data set, on the left of the data set, on the, plot, on the top of the dots, or below the dots. You will have to decide. You have to decide in such a, if it is an input input like this, they must all be on the right, to the right. If it is input, input, like what you see here, the labeling should be on the right because you are going to create a radial lines to the origin. Radial lines to the origin. So you want to be able to do that. Let me see by hands those who have been able to do what you have on your screen. Okay. Five people, presumably, have done that. You should be able to do that. Okay, you should be able to do that. And then you label it nicely. And you don't have to do too much of the cosmetic activities like making this different color, you know, because the original one I think is blue. So making a different color and trying as much as possible to make it bigger. All of these gimmicks, all of these cosmetic activities, you can ignore them for now. In your own spare time, you should master this. Okay, now let's draw the radial lines. We are going to draw the radial line. Radial line means you draw a kind of a zigzag line from DMU A naught. Now, right now, consider all of them as DMU A. No, do not bring time into the picture. All of you should lower the hands. Those who have done. So I'll be calling them A, B, C instead of A, not Z, not. But when we start going into the productivity analysis, I'll now bring the time dimension into the picture. So you now create a radial line from the plots from the DMU to the origin. Radial line from the DMU to the origin, from each DMU to the origin, from each DMU to the origin. And you should have like what you have on your screen. Now, what you have on your screen now. You can see that we have labeled it now. X2 is on the left axis, and X1 is on the horizontal axis. Create the radial line. And you can see that I have also joined with a blue line. I've created a frontier. Now, remember the assumptions of DEA. DEA says a piecewise linear convex and piece wise, linear. Linear here means a line. So you, there's a, you gotta draw a line from A naught to B naught. But you don't draw a line from A naught to E because you are focusing on points that are not dominated. You are focusing on points, data points that are not dominated, that are not you know, dominated. And then let's take an example of a data set like E naught. If you look at E, you can see that B is on the same line as E. And yet B is using less input than E. How do we know? Well, look at the input X1 for B, it is three. And input X1 for E, it is 7.5. So you can see that B is using more, less input than E. So B is dominating E. B is efficient relatively than E. So E is dominated. But you cannot say the same thing for, for a B and C. Because even though B is using input 3, X1 of 3, and then C is using X1 of 5, which appears that B is doing better than that. When you come to the X2, C is using two of the X2 and B is using three of the X2. So C is a champion 
when it comes to the X2, and B is a champion when it comes to the X3, uh, X1. So you can't say that one is better than the other. So those that are dominating others, those that are not dominated, what you might call it, they are not Pareto efficient, more or less. Those are the ones that will form the frontier. Those that are not, no. Now, ideally, the frontier would have been from B to C. But then the principle of free disposability, monotonicity. Do you remember the assumption of monotonicity? Monotonicity assumption says that you can freely dispose of input and output. Do you remember? Do you recall? Yes, Doc. Yes, you doc. can freely dispose of inputs and outputs. And for that to happen, the line, the vertical line, when you have raised this, the final, the final analysis of the frontier drawing requires that you create that free disposability line. So you take a vertical line from B upward, and you take a vertical line, a horizontal line, from C rightward. And these stretched lines will, will represent the free disposability line. Because let me tell you why you need those lines. It just happens that A and D happen to be on the free disposability lines. It just happened. It just happened that A and D are on that line. But those lines would have been drawn anyway if there were no A and D. D. Why? Because if you look at D and you compare D to C, you can see that C is dominating D. Do you guys see that? C is using less input, which is 5 of X1, than D, which is using more input rather, which is 8 of X1. So ideally, D should not have been on the frontier because it's dominated. However, the free disposability assumption says that the free disposability assumption, we says that, you know, fans should be on, um, on, the, on, on the inefficiency is possible. Okay, inefficiency is possible and that firms can freely dispose of inputs and outputs. That, that is the line that was being drawn for the vertical B upward and the horizontal C rightward. And so on the basis of this, you have created, remember the definition of DEA is, it's a convex envelopment you know, frontier. You create that first using the best practice firms. And in this case, the best practice firms are those that are forming the frontier. Now, now that we've done all of the drawing, the boundary of the production possibility set is the A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D, that's a boundary. That's a boundary of the production possibility set. That is a frontier. But the spaces to the right, the spaces to the right are all known as the technology set, the technology set. So all spaces to the right of the DMU spot are the technology set. Now, based on this, you are gonna answer some few questions. And I'll be calling any one of you to give me those answers. One, which D- Hello, Doc. Yes. Hello, Doc. And sorry to cut you, but please, can you demonstrate how you drew the radial lines? Okay, what you do is that you go to insert and then you look for, I think, figures. And then when you look at the figure, it will originally be a normal line. It will not be a zigzag radial line. It will be a normal line. And so with that normal line, you will click it and come and put it anywhere in the graph here. And then when you click on the line itself and both edges of the line are highlighted, you will now go and look for the
features of the line. You go and look at the features of the line. And in those features, you see how to deepen the line, how to dash the line, how to, you know, several other features of the line. Okay. You normally are able to do this when you, when you are able to click on the line, it will give you the true features of the line. Okay. Where to find that? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, please. I don't know where to find that. You don't know where to find that. This is if it could. Clear. So you have three, three, five, eight, seven. Yes, yes please. And the other one is five, three. Yeah. Two, two. Yeah. And three. So this is a data set. Okay. So when you are highlighting, you highlight it like this. And then after highlighting like that, you go to insert at the top here. And when you go to insert, you see pictures, you see shapes. You also see on the right here charts. So under the chart, you click that little one, which is scatter plot. This one is the seven. Scatter plot. Okay. You click on scatter plot and then choose this. And once you choose it, you can click on the chart and rename it. Okay. So here is where I clicked it and you call it hypothetical. Okay. Or well, let's say artificial DMA. Create these hypothetical DMUs. And then you know that this is one. Okay, it's the first one. But how do you know? When you put a cursor on it, it will tell you the number. Okay, so that is DMU A. So how do you label it? You see format here. Okay, but before that, let's give it the horizontal line. We need to label the horizontal line. So once you are here, you can click on the place called um, element, add chart. Then you choose something we call axis titles. And you click primary horizontal. The moment you click primary horizontal, this one will show here. And then you just come and then call it X1. Then you go to that same add chart element. You click axis titles. You see primary vertical. Primary vertical, that will show you the axis title. Then you rename it. Click inside and rename it as X2. Are you guys following? Yes, please. Yes, doc. Then you have to now label these ones. This is why your situation is. Okay. So when you go to the label, we click on format. Once the whole data is selected, click on format. On the top here, you will see just right on the page layout. You will see this line. So you will click on the line like that. When you come here, the line is showing. Then you click on this. You click on this. Let me just do it again. So I need to go back to insert again. You can even choose it as shapes, or you can still go back to format and click on the line. Then you click on the DMU A. And then you drag it to where the origin is. You nudge it. You nudge it slightly to where you want it to be. So that is a line now, which you pick. Now, now that this line is highlighted, you can now go to um, shape outline. Okay, shape outline. When you look at shape outline, you will choose dash, dashes. And then under dashes, as you select any of the dashes, you will see that the line dash is changing. Do you see? Yes, please. And then you can now select one of them. Okay, let's just say this one. Okay. And then you can re recolor the line. And recolor the line. And how do you do that? You can choose any of these. Okay. To recolor. Or you can come back here and then select any of these colors. 
Now that you've done for one, you don't need to do for all the rest. You can copy that one. So I just click on the line, choose Control C to copy, Control V to paste. The line is back here again. Then you can now go and pick this line and then give it to this second one. Okay, DMU B. You can merge it. You can click and merge it gradually to that. Yeah, you, you see what I'm trying to do? Yes, sir. You can merge the thing. To that. And then you can, it's already control C copied already. So you can do control V again. Get the next one. And then nudge it for this next one. Okay. To this. Control V again. Then the thing will be pasted. And then you can unnudge it for the third one. For this fan E. I'm sure you're following what I'm doing. You are, you are moving all of them towards the origin. Then control C again. Control C again. Then you can now move it to the origin. And then finally, now drag it down to the last one here. And that will help you nicely to be able to draw the radial lines. Do you follow? Yes, please. Now, we are going to draw the frontier. To draw the frontier, you can select any of these lines. Let's take this line, say this yellow line. Okay. move away from the highlighting and then go to insert and then go to shapes and then just choose a line a new line Make it a particular line okay. let's make it a vertical line like this i'm just creating any vertical line then Let's bold in that line because it's going to be a frontier. And then nudge it now to this point. And slow it down to. Like that. And then you can even use your. At this stage, you can use your. The weight and the height here to reduce the height. See? What I'm clicking, I'm clicking on the top right here of the Excel to reduce the height. And then you can do control C to copy, control V to paste. When you paste it falls here, then you go and pick it now, come and continue, because you know this is the frontier, and then nudge it now to get the second one. And then you can control V to paste again, and then go and pick, uh -oh. Go and pick this, and then sometimes it doesn't work the way you want, but you have to take your time and nudge them. And then pick the last one, you know. And you can use these lines to, you know, reduce the. Are you all getting the idea? Yes. Yes, dog. Yes. 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 Yes.
Right. So that, that's what you see there. If you want to label the names of the DMU, okay, once you click inside here and you want to label the names, go to insert and then you choose these shapes and select text box. So text box, you come and click here. Once you click here, you have A, you can label the A and then close this thing a little. Nudge it, close it, and then move it. Okay. Move it. You can use the arrow control and arrow up. Okay. If you click and choose shift. Sorry, this is You can nudge it. You can nudge it gradually to where it is. Then move it slowly to where it's supposed to be. And once you are done with this A, you can copy and paste OC Control V and then rename it. Okay, it has come to this section here. You can rename it as B. And then go and pick this B. You can rename it as B. And then pick this B. You can now move it to this side. You, you have a fair idea of what I mean, right? I'm not really speaking to students, honestly. Okay, you have a fair idea of what I mean. So you can move it and then kind of rename it to give it the same thing to work. And then that was it. So let's move from the Excel and go to the slides. So this is a slice and this is exactly what we did up here. I want to pay attention to how we calculate efficiencies using the graphs here. The first thing you do is to estimate the technical efficiency. Estimate the technical efficiency and write this down. That technical efficiency, and this is... This is input orientation. This is orientation. And in an input orientation, your definition of efficiency, I'm just gonna write it here for you, okay? The technical efficiency input orientation is given by the distance to the frontier. divided by the distance to the fan or the DM. And we refer this technical efficiency as theta, as theta. So we are going to calculate theta for DMU A. We calculate theta for DMU B. We calculate theta for DMU C. We calculate theta for DMU G, what happened? For DMU G, and then on and on and on and on. You get it? Yes, do. Yes, do. That's how we are going to do the computation. So let's go and see how we do it. Remember, and it, it, as a beginner, you want to memorize this definition: distance to the frontier divided by distance to the fence. Now let's go back. Now you see how we do the computation. So to calculate for the technical efficiency for A, input orientation, okay, because there are two inputs, one output. And we learned last week that we normalize the output. Um, if you look at the A, to calculate efficiency score of A, it is distance from the origin. This is a radial proportionate distance. 
Radium because the, the information is taken from the origin. So the distance from the origin along the radial line to the frontier, the frontier is at this point. And you read the answer on the horizontal axis throughout, or you read the answer on the vertical axis throughout. So as an example, if you are calculating, and I'm going to write some things here. What is the distance from the origin to the frontier? What is the value? Anybody? Three. Three. So the theta, and I'm going to be using this part to do some little writing. The theta for A okay, is going to be that value which is three. Okay, so you pick that the distance to the frontier is three divided by the distance from the origin to the fan A. And that value two is what? Three. 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 So the answer, the efficiency score for this one will be three divided by three, which is one. So DMU A is having an efficiency score of one. Now, if you understand the principle of envelopment, you will notice that all the firms on the frontier will have the efficiency score of one. So we can say that this is the same as the efficiency score for theta B, okay, for theta C, for theta D, okay. But that is not the same for E because if you look at E, it is inside the frontier. So the score will not be one. Now, by the way, if you look at B, the score will be what divided by what? Who can tell me? For B, that gave us a value of one. It will be what divided by what on the horizontal axis? Three divided by Raise your hand. You see, at this stage, when you all want to talk, that's when I have a problem. What divided by what? Akutia. Um, Doc, this will be three divided by three. Still, stay there, Akutia. What about C? Um, C would be five divided by five. And then D. D would be eight divided by eight. Okay. Now, I want one of you, Abu Bakar, are you there? Yes, look. Okay. Using the same thing, how will you calculate these values using the vertical axis numbers? A. A will be what? Vertical axis number. Look. Look, please come again. How will you calculate the efficiency score of A using the vertical axis numbers instead of the horizontal axis numbers? Um, Doug, it will be... Uh -huh. Sorry? Using the vertical axis. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Doug, it will be five. Yes, I'm... Yeah, Doug, five over five. Five over five, five divided by... What about B? B will be three divided by three. C. C will be five, um, two divided by two. And then D. D will be two divided by two again. Okay. Do you know why I took you through this example? Because I want you to learn to compute them. And so you get the values on the vertical axis. That is how you do it. Okay. So you got to learn, but when you look at E, who can guess? It's not going to be exact. Who can guess, raise your hand, who can guess the value for E? Either using the vertical axis line or the horizontal axis line. Who can guess the values? How to compute it? Chris. Um, Doc, using the vertical axis, uh, the formula says it's the distance to the frontier over the distance to the DMU. So the distance to the frontier, I think it would be um, at two. So you are using which axis? Bit, the vertical axis. And if it was the horizontal, the guy is right, two, okay, because it will hit the point at C. And then if it is a horizontal, it would have been what? It was the horizontal. I'm honest, I don't think we can determine it from the from the graph because 
Uh, it's no, not complete. The distance to the frontier alone. To the front. Oh, okay. Then that would be um that would be three. Yes, that would not be three. That be three. Okay. That would not be three. Let's let me ask somebody else. Whose arm was up? Doc. Yeah, Edwin. Diana. Doc. Yes, Doc. There's a lot of noise in your background, isn't it? No, this place is very fine, Doc. Yes, Edwin, go ahead. Doc five. Uh, and then? And to the point to be seven so points. What's divided by what? And look, maybe 7.5 divided by five. Okay, your definition is wrong. Okay, let's go back to um, Chris. Chris, continue what you were saying. Yes, Doc. Um, okay, I was using the vertical axis. So I'd have to be in the numerator and um, DMUE is on three if you are using the vertical axis. So you get two over three, which is um, 0 0.67. Good. Yeah, efficiency. So, so he's right. So let's put that one down, okay? So the theta for E is going to be the distance from here to the frontier, which gives you a value of two. Then the distance from here to the fan, which gives you a value of three. Okay, and that will give you two divided by three. Sorry, two divided by three. That is how you calculated the value for E using the vertical axis. Now using the horizontal axis, using the horizontal axis, now, Edwin, come to yours. What will it be? 7.5 divided by 5. That is wrong because we say the distance to the frontier first. The, frontier. the distance to the uh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay. You and the definition, it be, eh? mm -hmm. yes, yes, please. Yes, please. So it will be rather 5 divided by 7.5. That is what it becomes. So it becomes 5 divided by 7.5. So we expect the answer to be the same. Because whether you use the vertical axis to calculate or the horizontal axis to calculate, you should get the same thing. Okay? Can you both confirm that 2 over 3 is equal to 5 over 7.5? Uh, yes. 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 It is. And so using this principle of radial contraction, we are able to calculate the efficiency. So you can see that E, we, we said earlier that E was dominated. And no wonder that it is inefficient with a score of less than one. Remember, the efficiency score, whenever efficiency score is equal to one, it means the firm is efficient. If the efficiency score is less than one, it means the firm is inefficient. And so, which DMUs are efficient? Now, let me see by hand. Which DMUs are efficient? Emmanuel Edu? Yes, the DMU A, B, C, and D are efficient. Okay. Joyce Amekogbe, which DMUs are inefficient? Joyce. Joyce. DMUE. Please, DMUE. Why? Why? Joyce, are you there? Because its efficiency score is less than mine. Because what? It's less than one. All right, okay. So these are the calculations that we did. Okay. These are the calculations on your right that we have done. This is it. This is what we just did to do the calculation all through. So you can see the DMUs that are efficient 
And we can see the DMUs that are. Ah. Um, let me just go back because I need to teach you something very important. Because you're going to do some of these things in your work. So focus and follow me rigidly now. Some of the things are on the frontier, but they are also still dominated. Some of the DMUs are on the frontier, the blue line frontier here. But at the same time, they are dominated by some of the other DMUs. Who can tell me which of these firms are dominated? Raise your hand and tell me. Which of these firms are dominated? Imano. No, please. Firm A and Firm D. Why? That's because with Firm A, if we compare it to Firm B, which of which both of them have the same level of X1 input, Firm B uses lower X2 input as compared to Firm A. And with Firm D, if we compare it to Firm C, they have the same level of X2 input, but FEMC uses less X1 input than FEMD. <clears throat> Excellent. So now I want you to take note of these two firms A and D. We call them efficient, but they are not truly efficient. In the world of Pareto Koopmans, they are not efficient. In the world of Pharrell, Pharrell 1957, okay, they are efficient. So these firms, firms that are dominated are said to be, and they are on the frontier, they are said to be weakly efficient. Take note, weakly efficient, weakly efficient. These firms are not Pareto efficient. They are not Pareto Koopmans efficient. They are weakly, they are not strongly efficient like B and C are strongly efficient. And they only happen to be efficient because they are on the free disposability line. So most weakly efficient firms are on the free disposable lines, the horizontal and the vertical lines. Whether it is input, input graph, output, output graph, or input, output graph. And that you should understand. And therefore, such firms may be exhibiting something we call mixed inefficiency. Because to be efficient properly, to be weakly, you see, if you look at D, for D to be efficient, it would have to remove some of the inputs. So right now, as it stands, it, it, and for it to be, you see, for, for D to be efficient, it will have to reduce some of the input from eight, even though we call it efficient, okay? It's not properly, it's not strongly efficient. So for it to be efficient, it will have to reduce some of the input X1 from eight to what? To five. And mind you, most of these firms that are weakly efficient, okay? Most of the time, they are weakly efficient on one of the inputs or one of the, yeah, one of the inputs or one of the variables, but not on all, not necessarily on all. So if you want to, and there's a problem here, and I want you to listen because some of you will be using this in your analysis. So in the process of moving horizontally from eight to five, it is no longer moving on the radial line. It is no longer moving. So the radial lines approach will be, will be useless. It will be changing the radial nature. It will not be able to reach its efficiency unless it ignores the proportional contraction of the input. Because to everyone here, if they want to be efficient, if you look at E, for E to be efficient, you have to move along the radial line, proportionally reducing ratio reduction. You gotta be proportionally reducing the input and the input, the X2 and the X1 at the same time, maintaining the ratio, maintaining the percentage of the reduction. But as you see D, D cannot maintain the percentage of the reduction again, because it will be changing the 
the mix of the input. Do you get it? Yes, please. And therefore, D is exhibiting mix inefficiency. C is mix efficient. B is mix efficient. B is mix efficient because it doesn't have to change the input mix. Now, E is mix efficient. It's technically inefficient. Take note. E is technically inefficient. Okay? Because it will be moving along the radial line and it will hit the frontier somewhere and it wouldn't have to reduce the inputs and the other input again. It wouldn't have to change the ratio. So E is mix efficient. But it is technically inefficient. Does it make sense? Yes, please. But if we were having another firm, like watch it, another firm just on top of D. Okay, just on top of D. And I'm going to do a drawing for you to just have a feel of what I mean. If we had another firm just on top of D, say here, okay, there. Then, and you trace it from the origin to where that firm is, watch. Let's say we had a firm F there. That firm will be inefficient, technically speaking, isn't it? Isn't it? Will the firm be mixed inefficient too? Will that firm be mixed inefficient? Will that firm be mixed inefficient? Emmanuel? No, please, Doc. It will be mixed inefficient. Really? It will be mixed inefficient. Who can tell me? Because, because the firm here is technically inefficient. We know that because it's not on the frontier. But when you try to bring it to the frontier along the radial movement, it is going to hit this point, isn't it? Is it not going to hit this point? Yes, please. Is, is, that, is that, point not, that point not a free disposability section of the line? It is. it is. So even if it hits this point, it is still now efficient but weakly. It's still efficient but weakly. And so it's exhibiting makes inefficiency. Take note of that. You guys have to follow me in all directions. You have to follow me in all directions. Now, let's go to another important concept for you. And this is known as PS. PS. Now, listen carefully. A peer is a real DMU that is efficient. A real DMU that is strongly efficient. A real DMU that is Paratokupman's efficient. A real DMU that is Paratokupman's efficient. So, what do we mean by that? Okay, so which DMUs are real? A, B, C, D, E. All of them are real. Take note. All of them are real. All of these DMUs are real DMUs. Okay, because you can see them. Because we had the data for them. They are real. They are not hypothetical. Now, which DMUs are hypothetical? Who can tell me any particular DMU here which is hypothetical? Who can raise a hand and tell me? Who can raise a hand and tell me? A hypothetical DMU. Chris. Um, Doc, an example of a hypothetical DMU would be the one you drew, the one you drew with the red, um, with the red ink, right to yes. that point D. Exactly. So any DMU, which is, which is anywhere, actually, any DMU, do you know that between A and B, there are so many DMUs? Yes, please. And even on the spaces here, there are so many, all of them are hypothetical. Any DMU, which is not a real DMU, but it's in the production possibility set. That DMU is a hypothetical DMU. 
And such DMUs, listen carefully, such DMUs, they make up DMU. They are called, if they are on the line, they are called virtual DMUs. They are virtual. So if I join a line between A and E, okay, anything on the line is a virtual DMU. And these virtual DMUs are hypothetical DMU. They are not real. They are hypothetical. They are artificial. They are virtual. Now, real DMUs are A, B, C, D, E. Now, some of these real DMUs can be peers. Some of the real DMUs can be peers, but they must be strongly efficient. So who can tell me among these five DMUs, which one of them is a real DMU? Raise your hand and tell me. Which one of them is a real DMU? Akutia. Um, all the five DMUs are real DMUs. Okay. Which one of them is a peer? You can raise a hand and tell me. Which one of them is a peer? Daniel. DMU B. Is that all? No, and then DMU C. But why did I have to tell you? Is that all before you tell me? You are not sure. So I said I should say just one of them. So I didn't say that. I said which one? So B and, so, B, and C. B, B and C are peer. DMU B and C are peer. Savia, can you tell us why they are peer? Doc, because they are real DMUs and they are strongly efficient. Why do you say they are strongly efficient? Because unlike the um, DMU A and D, they are not on the free disposability line. Good. Now stay there, don't go. Okay. Now, these real DMUs are the ones that, oh, sorry, these peers, okay, are the B and C. So I have a question for you. My question is, all peers are real DMUs, but not all real DMUs are peers, true or false? Look, that's a true statement. True or false? True. Okay. That's fine, that's correct, okay? So guys, note this point, write these points down, put them down in pen and paper, don't be watching, don't be just listening, okay? All peers are real, but not all real are peers. Because even though E is real, it's not a peer. So let me ask you, uh, Thelma, can A be a peer? Can A be a peer? Um, yes. Explain. Because um, it don't explain. Uh, you are wrong. Because what it means now it, to me is that you have been following. Oh wait, wait. Um. It's, wait, wait. It's, it's, sorry, sorry. They're not kidding. We are not joking at all. Sorry, sorry. We are not doing lottery. We are not guessing. I want to explain. You want to explain what? It's, why A is not a peer? So A is not a peer because it's not efficient and it's on the line of free disposability. We never use the word less efficient. Sorry, it's inefficient. We, we never said A is inefficient too. You are not paying us. Lowly, it's not high efficient. We are not pay, you are not paying attention. You are not writing things down with your pen. You are not focusing. So focus. That's my advice to you, okay? Okay. Focus. Focus. It will help you. It will help you. It will really help you not to be disappointed. So focus. So here is the thing. A and D are are not peers, even though they are real DMUs, because they are not strongly efficient. They are weakly efficient. This is critical. 
Now let's go to benchmarks. Another name for benchmarks is target. Another name for benchmarks is target. When I sneeze, I'll beg you to write it down. When I sneeze, write it down. Because you won't forget these terms. And so you must have your pen and paper with you. Okay, it's very important for you to do that. Okay, now watch it carefully. A benchmark is, a benchmark is one or a benchmark can be a real DMU or one of the hypothetical DMUs that is strongly efficient. Write it down. A benchmark is either a real DMU or a hypothetical DMU or virtual. Let's use the virtual. A real or virtual DMU that is strongly efficient. A real or hypothetical or virtual DMU that is strongly efficient. Who can identify a point, a point on the production space that can reflect a benchmark? Edwin. Say so four and 2.5. It's not it's like four and around 2.5. Oh, when is a four and 2.5? Is between uh -huh. okay. just between, use the uh -huh. between C B not and C not all the okay, points. So between B and C, any point yes. B and C. That's what you are saying. Yes, please. That's a point. Any point between B and C are B and C part. Yeah. Careful before you answer. Are B and C also benchmarks? If you didn't know, go and write, look at the definition of the benchmark I just gave you. Yes, I think, yes, they are, because they are, they're real or hypothetical. So B and C are strongly efficient and they are real. Perfect, you are thinking. I like people who are thinking, because when you don't think, you will give a wrong answer and you say, oh, please, then you start changing answers, you know. So they are real. that's why it's important to be writing things down when we are discussing, then you can follow. So they are real. And it can also be a virtual. So any of the DMUs that are in between B and C are virtual, they are invisible more or less, but they are there. And they are targets, they are benchmarks, they are targets. Now listen, when you, when you trace an inefficient DMU, in the context of E, which is an inefficient DMU, when we radially reduce the inputs downward, contracted the inputs downward, it hits the boundary of the frontier at point C. So point C becomes what for E? Point C becomes what for E? You can tell me, point C becomes what for E? Chris. Um, it serves as a benchmark or a target. It's a benchmark for, for E. Is it a target for E? Chris? Target. Yes, please. It's also a target. Is it a target for E? Is it a real yes, for E? Pardon me, please. I didn't hear you. Is it a peer for E? Um, it's, it's, it's a peer. It acts as a peer. Point C is a peer. No, is C a peer for E? No, it's not a peer for E, but then point C in itself. Are you guessing or you are not sure? No, I'm 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 not guessing. Are you sure? Or maybe I'm not understood. Yes, please. I've not treated this. Because C point C is a peer for E. Hello. Yeah. It's a peer for E, mute yourself. It's a peer for E. Okay. Now let me create another DMU here. Let me create another DMU called F here. Okay. F. If you look at F, and the way it hits the, the, the frontier is F prime. 
if you try to find, oh, by the way, is F efficient or inefficient? Anybody? Inefficient, Doc. Efficient. Inefficient. Okay. F is inefficient. Now, L explain. Yes, Doc. F is inefficient. Can you confirm whether it is technically inefficient or mix efficient or mix inefficient? F. Please, I think it is mixed. Uh, it is mixed. Mix what? It is mixed. What is it? Please, I think it is mixed inefficient because I'm looking at where it is. We, we established that the point B is like the perfect. So That's wrong. It, is, it can reduce. That's wrong. Let's move on to the next person. Okay. Yes. Confirm and explain to me, Joyce, whether it is mixed inefficient or is not, and whether it's technically efficient or technically inefficient. Joyce. Yes, Joyce. Yeah, Sylvia. No, please, it is technically um, no, Joyce, mute yourself. Joyce, you are two minutes away from behind us. Um, so mute yourself. Um, who was talking before? But it was Sylvia. Go ahead. DMUF is technically inefficient. Mm -hmm. What about in terms of mix? Xavier. It is also, it is also mixed inefficient. That's wrong. It's mixed efficient because when it comes, when you trace it to the line, you don't have to change the mix. When you, look, when you look at the radial line and you trace it all the way and it hits the radial line, that's it. That point is an efficient part. It's a strongly efficient part. It is only when you trace it to the radial line and it hits the horizontal or the vertical section of the graph, that is when you now determine that it's mixed inefficient and then you correct it. Does it make sense? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, now yes, let's, look at that. let's look at this point here now. So when you look at this point, okay, when you look at this point where the, 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 the F prime is, it is that portion, that portion is what to F? What we have discussed so far. It is what to F? Nathaniel. A boundary or target. Is what? A boundary or a target. It's a target. Forget about the word boundary. Because everywhere is a boundary, by the way. It's a target for F. It's a target for F. What target is it? A real target or a virtual target? That's a virtual target. Good. Now, C dot is what for E? C is what for E? C is a target for E. What target? Uh, the same question. What target? I don't. Virtual target or real target? You are coming to tell me you don't know the question. That's a a real a real target. So, so when I say it's a tar what target? You now know what I mean by what target? Okay. Okay. Look. Is also, a benchmark or is not? It's a benchmark. Okay. So a real benchmark. Okay. So C is a real benchmark for E. F prime is a real benchmark. It's a virtual benchmark for F. And they are all, it's also a virtual target for F. You should understand this peers, virtual benchmarks and targets. You should understand. You should really, really understand. So these are the intricacies. So I'm not going to ask you all some questions to be sure whether you've been following 
so far. And I will do a random selection of your names. Now, who can distinguish between peers and benchmark for me? Peers and benchmark. Peers and benchmark. If no hand goes, Hello, who is talking? Senior, please. Raise your hand. Peers or benchmark? Savior. Okay. Doc, please. A peer is a real DMU which is strongly efficient. However, for a benchmark, it can be either a real or a virtual DMU which is strongly efficient. Now, let me ask all of you a question. The, deep, the most difficult part of everything we've studied so far. All peers are benchmarks, but not all benchmarks are peers. True or false? Edwin. True. Explain. Um, for, for a DMU to qualify as a peer, it must be real. So, so, but it is already strongly efficient. For a DME to qualify as a peer, it must be real and strongly efficient. But for a, for a benchmark, it must only be strongly efficient. So it can be um, a benchmark by to be virtual. So that to disqualify from being a peer. Okay, that's a good answer. Just that you are winding about all peers are benchmarks, but not all benchmarks are peers. Okay. That is true because some benchmarks can be virtual. They can be virtual. Okay. Some benchmarks can be virtual. They are not real. And because they are not real, they cannot be considered as peers. Okay. Let me jump the next one and go to the target. All benchmarks are targets, but not all targets are benchmarks. Two of us. All benchmarks are targets, but not all targets are benchmarks. Somebody raise their hand and put a hand down. That should tell you how people are thinking. Yes, Daniel. Doc, that's false. Because benchmarks, benchmark is the same as target. That's it. Let's go to the next one. PS and real DMUs. All real DMUs are peers, but not all peers are real DMUs. True or false? All real DMUs are peers, but not all peers are real DMUs. False. Who is talking? Look, let me call you. Don't. This is not Makola. Okay. Yeah, for the first time, you know one. Tell so yeah, the answer. Please don't ever um, share the answer into the air until I've called you. Guys, Imando, Abebibi, mute yourself. I have not even called you. Yes, yeah. Hello, Doc. All peers are real DMUs, but not all real DMUs are peers. Because even looking at the graph, um, a O is a real DMU, but it is not a peer. So is it Pardon. Since I said, is it true or false? It's false. Okay. It should have been what? It should have been all peers are real DMUs, but not all real DMUs are peers. Okay. All right. Thank you. So now let's go to the last one. What do you think is the difference between radial measurement and non-radial measurement? What is the difference between radial measurement and non-radial measurement? Okay, so we have Emmanuel Edu. Yes, Doc. I believe radial measurements are proportionate, but non-radial measurements are improportionate. So don't do don't do opposites to tell me things. What is the real understanding of radial and non-radial? Not uh, you know using 
English synonyms to explain. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, please. My hand was up for the previous question. Sorry. So you are not your, your hand is not up for the explanation, eh? I, I'm still thinking through. So. Okay. So who can explain the difference between radial measurement and non radial? Because when you use such another word like proportional, you have not really explained well. Abini. And so for the radial measurement, it moves along a line drawn to the origin. Mm -hmm. Yes. But non radial, um, well, it does not move along. It, it's any measurement apart from a radial measurement. Okay. So, one of the things you will notice is that a radial measurement is a measurement towards the frontier, but in the direction of the origin. A measurement towards the frontier but in the direction of the origin. A non-radial measurement is any measurement towards the frontier that is not in the direction of the origin. That's key. Any measurement in the direction of the, any measurement towards the frontier, but not in the direction of the origin, that is non-radial. Any measurement, any measurement, okay, towards the frontier, but not in the direction of the origin. Is that clear? Yes, please. Okay. So now you have estimated efficiency score, which was, let's take E, the one, that's the one that is highlighted. Okay. How do you interpret the score? Your job is to interpret the score. And for you guys, your information, when you have your efficiency scores, eh, you're going to interpret the efficiency score, not for every firm, because they are DMUs. So you will sometimes calculate the mean, the median, the standard deviation, the minimum, and then the maximum. You will calculate them. And then you will now tell us the meaning of the average, the mean or the median, Speci spe specifically the median, okay? You will tell us the meaning. And so this is one interpretation of the meaning. If you look at efficiency score for E, E is an inefficiency firm with an efficiency score of what? 67%, 67%, 67%. Remember, this is input orientation. So what this means is that for this firm to be efficient, the input will have to be reduced. If you look at the graph here, the inputs, which are now 7.5 for the X1 and three for the X2, they will have to be reduced, contracted up to C. That's the target, okay, the, the real target. They have to be contracted up to C before this E can be efficient. So, if you have to be contracted by how much ratio, how many percent would they have to be contracted? You will have to contract all the inputs, reduce all the input by 33%. So the distance from E to C is 33%. So that means that you have to reduce 7.5 by 33%. And you will get to five. So if you like, you take your calculator, okay, you take your calculator, then you multiply 7.5 times 33%. And that will give you exact value of what? Five, which now becomes the target of X1 for E. And the same way you have to reduce this three to two. And that means that if you multiply the three by 33%, it's gonna take it down to two. And that will mean that we are talking about the reduction. So the definition is not seen as, so some people, let me tell you the, the, the danger here, that some, some people make a mistake, some authors, even some general article authors, they make the mistake. Eh? What they do is that, what they do is that, we normally would just say that E is 67% efficient. E is 67%. 
First of all, E is not efficient. First of all, E is not efficient. So once that definition is all right, it doesn't really help you much because already we've defined E as inefficient. So if you tell me that it's 67% efficient, you are telling me that, yeah, it's not 100% efficient, but that is not interesting. What is interesting is what it has to do to be efficient. So you tell me that E can possibly reduce all the inputs. It can possibly reduce the consumption of all the inputs by 33% before it can be efficient. So this is how we put it. To be efficient, DMUE must reduce the consumption of all inputs by 33% without changing the output. Of course, we know output is constant. That's what we mean by without affecting the output. In order to be efficient. In order to be efficient. So what you do is that you subtract the efficiency score from one to be able to better interpret it in that. When you come to interpreting output orientation, it's not simple. Because remember that the output orientation scores are always one or more. Did I say that in this course, that output orientation scores are greater than one? Yes. Oh. yes. yes. So for yes. such yes. ones, for such ones, if you are interpreting them, it's very difficult. So normally what you do is that there are two options. If you want to interpret them in the context of what they have to do to be efficient, listen carefully. If you have to interpret them in the context of what they got to do to be efficient, then you have to use the score which is one or greater than one. <laughs> you have to do that. You have to use a score which is one or greater than one. Or you have to take the reciprocal. You have to take the reciprocal of the number and then use it for your interpretation. So, so let's say that a score is, a score is, uh, a score is 1.5. Okay. 1.5 is actually three over two. Is that correct? Yes, please. Score is 1.5. This is efficiency score, output efficiency score, not input, but output efficiency score. This is the output efficiency score that you had. So this output efficiency score is 1.5. And, and, and the best way to interpret it, okay, for general interpretation is to take the reciprocal, which now becomes what? Two over three. And two over three is 67%, is that correct? Yes, please. Yes, please. 67%. And so that's 67%. You say the firm is 67% efficient. But that doesn't help you to be able to interpret it in what they got to do to be able to get to efficiency level. So how do you now interpret it better? Well, it is 1.5. So if it is 1.5, what do, do they have to do? The output will all have to be increased by how much for the firm to be efficient. We'll look at a couple of examples of these efficiency interpretations. Okay? But you want to understand how to interpret. This is critical because most of you will be doing output orientation. And I want you to read around it. There's another slide I've prepared for this. Now you have to read around it. That explains this output oriented efficiency interpretation. So now let's look at the summary. Now, I am doing some two things here. One of them has to do with the up values and then the down ones. Yeah, there are parts to what you guys are seeing here. It's a lot. So let's look at the first column here. Do you all see the first column? Yes. If you look yes, at yeah, you can see that we have the efficiency scores of one, 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 one for all the firms except firm E, you said it's 67%. And you can see that I've calculated the mean. So what does this mean imply? It means that on average, the average firm in this industry 
you know, has an efficiency score of 93. The efficiency score is 93. So generally speaking, you can see that the inefficiency of E has brought the efficiency scores of all the firm down. And so the mean efficiency. Okay? So it means that to be, to be efficient, all the firms will have to reduce on average. This is how you interpret it. To be efficient, all the firms will have to reduce their input consumption by 7% to be efficient. Okay? So you take 0.7 from the 0.93 from the 100 to get that. That's how you do it. Okay. Now, do you remember we spoke about variable return to scale and constant return to scale? You can estimate the variable return to scale and constant. In this very context of calculation, remember that output was normalized at one. And so the variable return to scale will surely be equal to the constant return to scale here. So you can see that. Okay. So even if you measure relative to the variable return to scale frontier, or you measure it, because first of all, these are small firms. They are not, the industry is made up of just five. So the sample size is already small. Okay. So you'll get the same score. Now, do you remember the way we learned how to calculate the scale efficiency? Do you remember? Yes, Doc. Okay, it is what divided by what? Yes. Technical efficiency CR is divided by technical efficiency VRS. Perfect. So that's what you see here. That's what you see. Most of you will be calculating this. Okay. Now, this is another model for computing efficiency score SBM. I'll come talk to that, that. Most of you will be using this. I'll talk to, about that later. Then some of you are doing returns to scale at the firm level. Is that correct? Yes, Doc. Yes, please. Now, this score will give you that returns to scale at the firm level. So you can see that in this context, all the firms are operating under constant returns. Now, this is not coincidental. It's simply because we have a small sample size, five firms. But if you have like 100, you come and realize that some of them are operating at decreasing returns or whatever. But the software will guide you on this as well. Now, let's go to the benchmark. And then Lambda. I'll come and talk about lambda later, but you can see that the benchmark for A is what? Is B. Do you see that? This is A. This is A. Yes, and its benchmark is B. Do you remember that that was the case in the graph? Yes, please. Yes. That we said that A is on the free disposable line. Mm -hmm. So even though it has an efficiency score of one, it's not strongly efficient, it's weakly efficient. So if you are really efficient, then you cannot be considered as a, a peer. So what he are trying to show you here is that the peer, in fact, they, they mistakenly call the benchmark peer, uh, you know, benchmark here. But the real thing is that the peer for A is B. And the peer for B is what? It's B itself. It's B itself, itself which means that B is what? Efficient. Strongly efficient. It means that B is strongly efficient because it is only when you are strongly efficient that you use yourself as your copy. By the way, the right PA is also called role models. Role models. So B is his own role model. He's not going to copy or learn from anybody. He's going to learn copy from himself because, and even somebody else, A is learning from it. Okay. So this, this column here helps you to know who is a peer. And you can see that the rest, C is a peer for itself. C is also a peer for D. C is a peer for E. Do you understand why C is a peer for D? If you can remember. Do you understand why? Yes. Who can? Yes, please. Who said yes first? Doc, Dinah. Go ahead. So um, D, D was also found on the free disposability line. And so we said it must reduce X inputs, the X1 inputs to five to become fully efficient. Mm -hmm. So that is why I see is X target. Yeah, that's it. And so you, how many peers do we have in this industry? We have two peers. We have two peers, two role models, five mm -hmm. and Now the Lambda, we'll come and talk about it. The Lambda has to do with the weight 
the weight that has been attached to, um, you see, the weight, if you take the lambda for A, it is the importance A attached to its, um, the importance A is given to B in helping him A to be efficient. And what if one here means that A is giving B all the importance for B to make him A efficient. We'll look at detail because I want to try and model the mathematical definition of the lambda. Okay, you will understand. It's sometimes something a bit of a controversial in the world of non archimedean principle as far as this lambda is concerned. Now, the rest of the movement here that you see here are called slacks. And when we come to learning slacks, you will come to appreciate this. Okay, but let me just give you something. Look at this number here, negative two. Do you guys remember that we said A is on the free disposability line? Do you remember? Yes, please. Yes, so yeah. if you are on the free disposability line, what it means is that you are generating slacks. You all will remember something related to in the in linear programming. Slacks are unused resources. Slacks, they are unused resources. X2 is a resource. X2 is a resource. So it means that there were some resources that A was supposed to use but didn't use. Or A is overusing the resources. A is overusing, and you can see that that was the case. If it goes critically to A, Let's go back to the graph. If you look here, you can see that A is using too many of the resources X2, okay? Five, four, three, before you get to B, okay? So there's a, a resource gap of what, two? That is a slack. The slack is overusing the input. And therefore, that is why A becomes weakly efficient. So this slack here in the software will give you the value and will tell you that. So A is not doing well on X2, but if you look at X1, it's doing well there. It's doing well on X1. Okay. And that principle can be used to do the computation we have here, which is called the SBM. The SBM is by Tone 2001. A man called Tone 2001 developed the, MBA, the SBM, which is known as a slack-based measure of efficiency. We'll look so this is just a glimpse of how your data will be distributed. If you have more years, then you have to do it for each year and get year by year and then generate more analysis. Then draw more graphs, scanner density graphs, you know, and be able to generate further things. That is just a tip of the iceberg for this small data set. Now at this stage, okay, the next thing will be to remind you of the general formulation of the efficiency. This is a generalized efficiency. Oriented. You remember what we did is, um, sorry, this is input oriented. Okay, this is input oriented. I don't know why. Let me just. Actually, this is this is input oriented. Okay, because the one you you all know the difference between the output oriented and the input oriented. You do you know? you see on the graph here is input oriented. Who could tell me what could change here if it was output oriented? Who can tell me what could change here if it was output oriented? No, please. The My theta would change to... Please raise your hand. Raise your hand. You have multiple people talking. Who would tell me? Yes, I would have Eric. Um, Doug, please. Um, the theta will go. It, sorry, the theta will change to phi, and it will be on the y instead. To be uh, to be multiplying the y instead. Sorry. Uh huh. And then what else? Yeah. What? Then the theta will not be there for x. All right. Okay. Looks like you have nothing else to say. Tell me. What else? And the objective function will be maximized. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's all. 
That's all. What else? What else? Because when you tell me that objective function will be maximized, that is not enough. I don't want to say it. I want one of you to correct everything. Yes, Derek. Derek, your hand is up. Yes, Daniel. So, so the theta will change to phi uh, in the objective function. So to be exactly. phi theta. The theta will also change to phi in the objective function. You only spoke about the theta changing to phi in the constraint. You didn't talk about it changing to phi in the objective function. So you have phi star before you bring your maximize. All right, this is the envelopment model. Keep that in mind. Now, the data set we work with is what you are seeing here. It is about time to formulate the model. Okay, I will pause here. So guys, let's learn how to do the formulation of this data set. I want you to now look on your own Excel and have this data set in your mind. We are formulating the envelopment model. We are not going to do the multiplier model at your level. You will not need that. In most papers, you don't even need a multiplier model. You will, you will just need to write the general, but you don't need to formulate the multiplier model. But for your thesis, whether it's undergrad, PhD, anything, I want you to learn how to formulate the envelopment model. So we are going to do this example for just these five things in this cross-sectional data set. Now, watch it. We are doing it for one thing. Remember, you always formulate for one particular thing. So this is the theta. It is this model that you are seeing here. That's what we are doing. First thing is to write theta star. Remember, it's an input oriented we just did. So we are doing it for fem E, so it will be theta E star. Theta E star. Then you bring minimize theta with a subscript lambda. The lambda is the weight. We'll talk about that. And then the, the theta as well. And that's what you see here. You see how we did it. The objective point is a very simple thing as you see. Theta. Who can tell me the difference between theta E star and theta E? Who can tell me the difference between theta E star if I don't get anybody, I'm going to call anybody. Deborah, what is the difference between theta E star and theta E? Deborah. Yes, Doug. What's the difference? If you don't know, just say you don't know. Let's move on. And then you go and learn it well. Please, I don't have an idea of what it is. You don't know or you know? Please, I don't. You don't. All we needed was for you to say you don't, you know, and yet you've taken us out some minutes, some seconds from that. Go and learn it. Go and learn it. Yes, there are many things you don't know. Go and learn it. Okay, who can tell us the difference between the theta and the theta star? Theta and theta star. Nathaniel. Look, uh, I don't know about that one. Um, this, this count, theta and theta star. This, mark, uh, this count. Ameke. Yes, Dinah. The, so the theta is what will help us help to move the inefficient frame to the frontier. And the achieved theta becomes the theta star. So what is the difference? 
So the achieved one, like the. <laughs> By achieved one, you have to be clear. The, um, Don't use the word theta in your definition. Because theta itself means something. That's the efficiency, the technical efficiency score. Mm -hmm. So, so, okay. so, um, the technical efficiency score that is derived becomes the theta star. And then? The theta is what is being, the, the objective functional, that is what is being sought. But the achieved one, or after running the model, the achieved one becomes the star, the theta star. Okay, so theta star is a number, that's it. Okay, Doug. Theta star is a number. Theta is just a representation. Theta star is a numerical value of the efficiency score. Theta is a representation of the efficiency score. And you should know. So, so the, that theta star you see there is a numerical value that you are looking for. And once you get it, then it becomes the theta star. All right. Now, the next thing is, and we are doing it for E. So the subject to here means that the weighted sum of all inputs, the weighted sum of all inputs. Now look at the inputs, okay? And the inputs are two. So we have to do the weighted sum of all input X1. The weighted sum of inputs, of all input X2. Weighted sum, first of all, sum is three plus three plus five plus eight. Weighted means that three must be weighted. And the weight is represented by lambda. So, and they are, they are different lambdas for each DNA. Okay? Because remember, you are weighting this lambdas. So let's call that the weight attached to DMV1 is three lambda one. The weight attached to DMV2 is lambda two. So the weighted sum for these two trace will be three lambda one plus three lambda two. Then going forward, it becomes three, five lambda three, three. eight lambda four, and then 7.5 lambda five. So that becomes the weighted sum of all the inputs okay, for X1. All the inputs of every DMU. Now, how do we know that is every DMU? You have J. J is representing every DM. And the, the, the inputs are different. That's why we have XI. The I is for the X1. The another I will be for the X2. So you got to wait and something. Then you do another one for this two. Okay. And then you now wait all of these inputs. So five lambda one plus three lambda two plus two lambda two plus two lambda two plus three lambda that. Then you have to do the same thing for the output. One lambda one, one lambda two, one lambda three, one lambda four, one lambda five, and then on and on and on. That is how you model the data. You are formulating the model. And so this is what you have here. I'm just talking about the left-hand side. All that I said is for the left-hand side. Now, I was talking about lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. But here, because the names of the firms are a, B, C, so it was lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, lambda No problem. First of all, this lambda is just a representation. Any question? Now, we are done with the left-hand side. The right-hand side should be the DMU you are assessing. In this context, we are assessing the DMU E. So the right variable will be the all of them should be less than or equal to. All of them should be less than or equal to three. And then for the output, all of them should be greater or equal to one. But then, because you are doing input orientation, as you can see here, okay, because you are doing input orientation, you give the theta. It's just the same formulation here. The theta should be attached to the very input, not input x. I, J, not I, J, not I, J, but I, not. I, 
notice it means only one of the DMUs is that one of the DMU or DMU E. Okay. And that's why you have theta multiplying that. Other than that, this is the output constraint. And then if we are doing VRS, this becomes a VRS constraint. Now remember the VRS constraint. You are all going to do this formulation. Take it from me. Your own data set. The VRS is the this lambda should add up to one. So lambda a lambda b, and you see it's a sum. So lambda a plus lambda b plus lambda c plus lambda e should be equal to one. Yeah. And then this last constraint, the non-negativity constraint says lambda a comma not plus. So there's no sum here. Lambda a comma lambda b comma lambda c comma lambda d comma lambda e comma should be positive. That's what you have also there. Now, anytime you bring theta is free, then it means that you are telling it that it should tell you the returns to scale for each fan. So this will tell you whether they are operating on a constant returns or variable returns to scale. get it? And I've put something here. In your thesis, always create a hypothetical data set and formulate the DEA model for one DM. Do you all get it? Tell me. Yes, yes. So two people should not go and formulate the same model. Two people should not go and use the same data. So when you're doing this, don't use your same data. Don't use the same data. Okay, any question on this? Now the interpretation is clear, okay? The DA seeks the, the linear programming, seeks the efficiency rating, which is a theta, by minimizing the factor theta, so the whole idea, if you guys understand it, the whole idea, when you come here, you attach theta, you multiply theta. So, so this value here, you guys have to understand what we are doing. So the value here is, is 7.5 and then 3. Okay, that's the values. And what you are doing is that you are attaching theta to 7.5, attaching theta to that. And it is this theta that is going to help this thing to move to this section, to the target. The theta will help. And once the theta helps to move the, the input from this 7.5 and 3 to the target of 5 and 3, once you get this value, that's what the linear programming is seeking to do. Once you get this 5 and 3, the target, by then you would have known the value of the theta itself. You would have known the value. That is what this is actually digging into. If you understand the principles behind this, you love what you are doing. Okay. Subject to, of course, the constraint, the weighted sum of the output in X1 and X2, input X1 and X2 of all things, okay, uh, less than or equal to the weighted of the. Now, let me quickly mention lambda before we con con conclude. What is lambda? Very simple, they are the weight, the importance assigned to DMUs. Please note, they are importance assigned to DMUs, not assigned to input and output. So as far as DMU E is concerned, which other DMU or which DMUs are helping him, E, to be efficient? Which DMUs is he going to consider to be those helping him. And those, those weights must be determined during the optimization process. During the linear programming process, the weights are determined. And if a particular thing is seen to be important, 
that firm will be given a positive lambda value. It can be 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.1. Okay? If only one firm, only one firm is considered, like you guys saw, if only one firm is considered as the only one being considered to be important to this very evaluating firm, then that evaluating firm will give that lambda all to this peer. Okay? So the weights of the peers okay, for each DMU. So if a particular DMU sees himself as his own peer, he will give the entire weight one, not 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.0, not sharing, I will give all of them to itself. So the weights are the significance, the coefficients, the multipliers, the importance attached to a particular DMU's contribution to the efficiency assessment of this particular one and evaluation. Here is a conclusion that mathematically, all DMUs with non-zero lambdas, all DMUs with non-zero, non-zero means they have positive lambdas, non, not negative lambdas, positive lambda values, all of them are the ones that serve as role models. So if you are not serving as a role model, you will not be given any, any lambda value at all. You will not be given any lambda mm -hmm. value at all. But if you are considered to be that, you'll be given. Now, what does the theta do? Theta reduces the current input levels to their target levels. That's what theta does. It reduces the current input levels to their target levels, and that's objective. And so if the current input levels are the same as the target, then theta will be a value of one. I should have asked you that question. Then theta. That brings us to the end of the lecture on technical efficiency assessment. Technical, technical efficiency, okay? So if you're a researcher, you are strongly encouraged to examine the lecture slides on the slack-based model. The one I said, some of you will be doing. The one that I said, you have the slack-based and the super-efficiency slack-based model. This slack-based model is what most of you are can use it. But the principle is the same, but you just need to learn how to model the slack-based model. I have that slide, and I'll give you that slide. What I've done is just, I've sent you this into your folder. So your, your group page. So this is a slack based model. It first talks about radial model. Advantages of the radial models. Because the slack based model is one of the non-radial models. Okay, there are other non-radial models. Okay. There are quite an, 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 a couple of non-radial models, but the slack based model seems to, you have the directional distance function you know, the geometric distance function, all of these things are hyperbolic distance function. They are all non radial models. In fact, there are quite a number of them that I explained here. Let me just show you. So these are the models of chance Russell measure of fair and Knox level, enhanced Russell graph model, range adjusted measure of Cooper, slack based measure of tone. That's the one you are going to learn. The geometric distance function of Tanasolis and Potter, hyperbolic distance function of fair, gross copper, and level directional distance function of chambers. All of these are non-radial models. Okay. Some of them are very complex. Some of them are quite questionable. But the ones that are mostly used are the radial model, the slack-based model. Then you have the directional distance model. This is also mostly used, okay? Few, very few people use the geometric distance function, okay? Especially those people from, um, Warwick University, Aston University, and some few other universities that I know. And not quite long, some people are also using the enhanced Russell kind of graph model. Okay, few people are using that. But, but the SBM is, is commonly used. So this one talks about issues with the radial models, which I've given you here, the advantages of the radial models. Then these corrections, the, the advantages of the SBM, the unit invariance, the monotonicity, and all of that. And then now it gives you the input oriented slack based model. The input oriented, this is a constraint. 
and then he explains, okay? And then he gives you the output oriented and all of that. In fact, there is something interesting that one of you